All right, thank you, Pastor Phil, and thank you all uh, for your warm welcome here. It's great to be back at Cornerstone, and um, I'm ex excited about my time uh, uh, back in Britain. Um, uh, before I get started, I, I, I need to take care of a little bit of uh, business here, and I want to um, uh, tell you about some of the books that, that I have available. You know, it's always a frustration for a Bible teacher that there's not enough time to say everything that we want to say, and so that's why we write books, <laughs> so, so we can get to the point of and the spoken word. And then, if you want to look into the minutia and the uh, the details, you can you can uh, follow through. This book uh, called God Tsunami, I wrote just over 20 years ago, and it was uh, it's based on a vision of the gospel of the kingdom. This this wave of 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 spiritual transformation starting out from Israel 2,000 years ago, reaching the ends of the earth, and then coming back to Jerusalem. That's that's the tsunami, and, and uh, you know I wrote it before people uh, in the West at least really many of them before many people knew what a tsunami was because it was it was just about a year or so maybe yeah about a year b before the big uh, indonesian tsunami uh and then of course the the more recent one in japan okay that that made these words a uh, household uh, word uh, around the world but uh but i liked the word and anyway because i thought it 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 described this wave of transformation so this book has been translated into 25 different languages over the years uh, and has gone out uh, to m many different countries. And the reason I'm, I'm, I'm really f uh, asking you to focus on it this morning is that there's a whole new generation of young prophetic Christian leaders r rising up, okay? And uh, often they come to visit us on Mount Carmel, okay? Because, you know, if you're prophetic, you're gonna come to Carmel eventually, okay? Because because of the prophet Elijah. And, and, and you know, in, recent, in recent months, you know, we've hosted these, these uh, younger leaders, and they're not young. I mean, they're not young people. They're not in their 20s or their 30s, but they're younger than me, okay? And, and they're telling me about this vision that God has given them of the gospel reaching the ends of the earth and then coming back on its way back to Jerusalem. All right, and they're you know kind of instructing me on this vision and and uh, and how I, I, I'll tell you what happened last week. We had a, a couple, and the, the the guy sat down at lunch with me at, at our ministry in Mont Carmel, and he said, uh, "We said, so what have you been doing?" He said, "Well, you know, I just got back from the North and South Pole." I said, really? He said, I said, really? The Poles? And he says, yes. And so he told us a story about, you know, Russian research icebreakers, you know, that go through the ice and then an expedition that treks across the polar ice cap and right to the point and then the similar thing in the South Pole, okay, that he'd done. And not really recently, but over the recent years. And I said, so why did you do that? And he says, oh, well, because God gave me a vision. The, the, the gospel is coming back to Jerusalem from the ends of the earth. <laughs> And I went, oh, okay. And that was just one of two or three that, uh, you know, I've told. So since I wrote this book <laughs> 20 years ago, I thought, you know what? You know, I'll bet people really need to learn about that, how it relates to Israel and the end times. Okay, so that's God's tsunami. And uh, it, it does focus uh, a good deal on Asian and African nations and the role that they play in bringing the gospel back to Jerusalem in the end times. All right. This book, I think uh, you're already familiar with, is the, the follow-on for, for that book, How Does the Gospel of the Kingdom Come to Earth? And uh, this is a, a manual to get people on the path of becoming and making high-quality disciples. Okay, not, uh, you know, and I'm, I, I'm, my, my vision is that the church uh, is intended to be a factory of disciple lives. And it's the disciple lives that are produced by the church. Uh, and this is God's plan A and there's no plan B, all right? The disciple lives produced by the local church are, are his instrument in bringing the kingdom to earth. And uh, we, don't, we shouldn't expect to change the world as Christians by, um, by producing low quality products. Okay, we've got to we've got to increase the quality of our of our product, uh, and uh, and that and that's really the, the way uh, to change the world. So we want higher quality, 
every year higher quality disciples coming out of the local church, going out into society. Okay, so that's this, this book. And so this is a, a roadmap for getting on that path uh, to become a higher quality disciple. And then to, you can use this book uh, as, a, as a path to lead others to, to similarly become that. All right, so that's, uh, that's Equip. This is a, a school, the Mount Carmel School of Ministry is a 12-day immersion into modern Israel through the eyes of the local believers. So this is a course, a 12-day course in Israel. And these are 12 full days, so it actually would take you about 14 days because you probably need a day of, of travel. Uh, okay, so it's 12 days in Israel, uh, and it was meant to be the, the reverse of the standard Christian pilgrim visit to Israel where you have a, a non-believing guide, a non-believing bus driver, and you're never, uh, you never meet a local believer. So this was just kind of, it's kind of a, 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 a unicorn, <laughs> all right? It's like, a, it's like a, a different approach to Israel that's based on, on the understanding of the local congregation. So we bring you into the local congregation, you begin by celebrating uh, Shabbat with us. You learn to uh, worship, to pray, uh, and, uh, and to learn uh, with us. We introduce you to our friends, Messianic Jews, Arab Christians in the land, and then we begin to take you around our country to the sites of biblical significance, and we explain those sites to you uh, from the Messianic perspective. Okay, so this is a, a 12-day immersion. Uh, it, uh, we, we, uh, we designed it for pastors and we've opened it up for everybody who has a, a strong uh, walk with the Lord, who already knows the Bible uh, and, uh, and wants to serve the Lord in some way. All right, it's not for new believers, it's not for pre-believers. Uh, it's meant for people who really want to connect the biblical Israel with, uh, with modern Israel through the eyes of the people who are in the land, uh, extending the kingdom in the land. Okay, so if you're interested in that, there's a, there's, there's a flyer. It's not um, inexpensive. You can see me later about how, uh, how, how, much it, how much it costs because we put you in hotels and, and uh, things like that. And so, um, but sometimes there are scholarships available, all right? And so please, if you're, take a look at the, at the flyer. There's also a website and you can learn about it. And if you at all feel interested, you can contact us and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at your case, all right? Okay, uh, let's see. Now, let me turn on my devices. It's, you know, it's always so disconcerting in the morning when your digital device does not recognize you. There we go. Excuse me just a second. Though. All right. All right, well... I'm so grateful uh, to have this opportunity to speak to you this morning. And uh, thank you, Pastor Phil, and for, for this wonderful fellowship. And, uh, you know, I had uh, just a few words uh, with your pastor before the service, and I know that, that he's uh, spoken to you uh, recently about Romans chapter 11. And that was the topic that I had, had also uh, chosen for this morning. And so what I'm, what I'm going to uh, do is, is present a, a complementary teaching, okay, uh, that goes alongside uh, this incredible uh, chapter in the New Testament scripture and uh, to reinforce, okay, what, you, what you've been taught and to, to really give you, a, a, to broaden your worldview and also I think you know, it, it should help you uh, set your watch uh, for, the, for end time revelation. Like, what time is it, okay, in terms of God's, uh, God's uh, end time plan? I think so much is in this, uh, is in this chapter that we could go a long way. Uh, and it's, not, it's worth more than just a, a couple messages. So let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'll open our hearts and minds uh, to hear what the Spirit is saying uh, to the people of God. I ask, Lord, that you'll stir up uh, the gift uh, to teach uh, in me to be clear and concise. I pray that you'll redeem, you'll redeem this time uh, and you'll use it uh, for your purposes. And we want to commit every minute to you in the name of Yeshua. Amen.
Okay, so we're living in, in a day when, when we've, we're, we've seen these two incredible events take place that have significance for all people who are uh, believe in Jesus and who love uh, the Word of God in the Bible. And the two, two great events are the restoration of the Jewish people to the land that was promised to them by covenant, uh, uh, according to the Word of God, the restoration of the Jewish people to their land and the reemergence in Israel of Messianic believers. All right, so this is a, you know, we're talking about the resurrection of a nation that uh, should, uh, should have died long ago, uh, the resurrection of a nation that was destroyed uh, and yet now has risen from the ashes of the, of the death camps, uh, has risen, risen from the ash, ashes of, of the Holocaust, the, the remnant has returned, and now it's, uh, we're beginning to see the, the, the restoration of a vibrant modern nation. And do we understand the connection between the two is simply, uh, it's not the virtue of the Jewish people, it's not uh, superiority in any kind of way, it's simply the faithfulness of God to his word. We serve a covenant-keeping God. He brought them back because he said he would. And now they're back, and in the midst of Israel is emerging a messianic remnant, a remnant of, of Jews who stand together with their Arab Christian brothers and sisters who are welcoming Yeshua back to his own land. They're welcoming him back in his own language uh, and among his own people for the first time in 2,000 years. So these two events have basically taken place on our watch, and they, they change a lot uh, about our understanding of the timing uh, uh, in which we live, the, the days uh, in which we live, and they also change a lot the way we understand the Bible. We have, to, we have to give up some of the ancient historic Christian ways of interpreting the Bible and understanding what is written in the scriptures, and we have to accept them uh, in a new way. And one of the main areas uh, is the heart of the New Testament and the book of Romans. You know, for, for many people, uh, the book of Romans uh, is, is like a, is, is one of their favorite books in the Bible. And, uh, and some of you know you've been taught in, your, in, uh, in adult Sunday schools or Bible school classes or online or in books about the Roman road. Okay, and the Roman road is, are the first uh, chapters of uh, the book of Romans that are so systematic, so comprehensive, so, uh, so um, uh, biblical in, in their laying out of the, the plan of salvation that the Roman road has been, has been taught as a means to lead your unbelieving friend to Christ simply by going through those first, first chapters of Romans, okay, the Roman road. If you're not familiar with it, let me just kind of take you through an, an outline of, of what this means. Okay, so you start Romans in the beginning. You have uh, Romans chapters 1 and 2. God is the creator of everything. You learn about unbelief and its consequences. Okay, so that's how Paul begins, begins a letter. You go down that road. Let's go on to chapter 3. We learn that everyone is a sinner Everybody needs forgiveness. We learn that our justification or the way that we, that we find forgiveness of sins is through faith. And when we believe, uh, we have access to the forgiveness that is offered by God. Uh, here's an example from Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, so now we're moving down this uh, incredible, incredible road. We, let's go on. Uh, we go down the road. God gave us a way to be forgiven for our sins, and this is through his son, uh, Jesus the Messiah. And uh, let's uh, look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, this is so systematic and wonderfully uh, comprehensive. Let's uh, keep going on. We come uh, to now to chapter 6, and we learn if we remain sinners, we will die. However, if we repent from our sins and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we will find eternal life. Here's what it says, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, now are you ready to pray and become a believer? All right. That's the Roman road. It's these wonderful six chapters, systematic, comprehensive, sequential. Okay, you start one, you go through six, and you're ready to, uh, ready to believe and, and start a new life. 
Okay, but this is just the beginning of the letter, as you know. And so now we get to Romans chapter 7. And in Romans chapter 7, the apostle takes a turn, okay? He, he, the, the, it, it's not straight down the road like it is in the first six chapters. And in chapter 7, the apostle Paul begins to what we call self-disclose, okay? He, he kind of gets personal, and he begins to say, well, of course he believes all of these great truths that he just taught us, but the truth is that he struggles with them, <laughs> all right? He's struggling, he has a struggle, and he has a struggle with the requirements that he finds in the words of God and, and the desire that, is, that God has put in his now reborn heart to obey the Lord fully, but then he finds within himself this, this, uh, th this fleshly nature that is dragging him away from obedience to God. Okay, and so he calls it the law of sin and death. There's something, it's, it's so strong in him, pulling him away from the obedience that he wants to have and, and this conflict that he describes in himself in Romans chapter seven is so intense that by the time he gets to the end of Romans chapter seven, he cries out, who will save me from this body of death, right? All right, he's, he's, he's really struggling in other words, all right? Now, <clears throat> for many of us who followed Paul down this wonderful Roman road for six chapters, then when we get to chapter seven and we realize that he's struggling spiritually, personally, struggling with, the, with, with God's truth, okay, uh, some of us were just shocked. You know, we thought, this is the great Apostle Paul, okay, the writer of inspired scripture. You know, he's, 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 he's struggling. I thought by now, you know, a man of this stature would have had it all together by now, okay, you know? Some of us were shocked, but the rest of us were relieved, okay? The rest of us thought, well, you know, if if someone like Paul can struggle with God's truth, I guess it's okay if someone like me struggles a, a little bit too. Uh, the rest of us were relieved, and the reason we were relieved is because the fact is we all struggle, right? In fact, in fact, you don't really struggle with the truth of God until after you become a believer, okay? It's only after you believe and after his requirements have meaning to you until after the desire has been birthed in your heart to really obey God and to live a life, a believing life, that's when you really start to struggle. And you, you realize, you know, okay, so Paul is doing that, you know, phew, I, I, guess, I, I guess it's, it's uh, you know, I guess I'm, I, I'm having that same, that same experience, okay? And that's because we identify with his struggle in chapter seven, that's why for so many of us, Romans chapter eight is our favorite chapter in the Bible, <laughs> all right? Because it begins with the words, okay, there is therefore now no condemnation, okay? For those who are in Christ Jesus who walk after the spirit and not after the flesh, we go, oh, thank God. You know, this means that God isn't gonna condemn me for struggling with God's requirements. Okay, it's, it's okay to struggle. And in fact, he is, he is gonna bring judgment, but when he, his, the hammer of judgment comes down, it's not on me, it's on sin. Okay, that's what we learned in the first, uh, first verses of Romans chapter eight. God condemns the sin, okay? He, he's, he's, he's put, he wants to put the sin to death so that the requirements of God's law can be fulfilled in us not just in Jesus, that requirements of God's laws can be fulfilled in us who walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. And the rest of chapter eight is like, is like, a, 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 like, a, like a song of praise to the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Okay, the Holy Spirit is, is working within us. We learn later in this chapter that the Holy Spirit is, is in us, is praying for us, is interceding for us with groans that can't be uttered. I mean, even when we don't even know what to pray for or how to pray, the Holy Spirit is still praying for us. We learn that he's continually interceding, that part of his, his role in filling us is to, is to intercede with us and through, through our struggles. And we learn that, all things work together for good, okay? Because, because, I think because of his intercession. 
All things will work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Okay, this, I mean, this is amazing truth, okay? And we go on towards the end of the chapter, we realize nothing is going to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. You know, height, depth, things in heaven, things beneath heaven, demons, angels, powers, principalities, sickness, tribulation, the sword, persecution, nothing is going to separate us from the power of God that is in the Holy Spirit and this, this incredible righteousness that's poured out as a godly gift of grace on those who are faithful and have accepted that we're going to walk in the spirit of God. And I mean, what an incredible chapter, right? So we love chapter eight. We could camp out there forever. But at the end of chapter eight, we're still only halfway through the letter. There are 16 chapters in Romans. <laughs> We're still only halfway through. Now, I, I'm sure that you've been taught a little bit about the, the error of replacement theology, okay? This was a doctrine that the church held for over a thousand years, okay? That Israel had fallen from grace. Israel, because of uh, the, her sins, uh, had, had once had a covenant with God, but that covenant was broken, it was over, it was discarded, and that the church, the Gentile church, had replaced Israel in God's uh, redemptive plan. And that meant the, the Jewish people were not only to be pitied, but to be scorned. And not only to be scorned, but be held in contempt. And not only to be held in contempt, they should be punished, okay? Because they failed the Lord, and they've fallen, and, and they, they, they refused, uh, refused his Savior. Uh, they're to blame, okay? And this, this became uh, a, a sin uh, in, in the church, a cancer that, that, that spread. Uh, and, but I, I think here in Romans, we begin to see the theological seed for this error that became enshrined in Christian doctrine uh, for over a thousand years that only now is being wiped away because of these two great events of our time. The fact that they're back now in their land, okay? That they've risen from the dead and from the ashes of intense industrial level persecution. And now they're alive again as a modern nation. And more than that, now in the midst of Israel, a believing remnant of Israelis who worship Yeshua and are welcoming him back, okay, to their own land to be Messiah and King once again in the land of Israel over his own people, okay? Th these events have shattered this, okay? But you have to wonder, how did the church hold that doctrine for over a thousand years? I mean, and, and it really was a doctrine. I mean, there were there was official persecution of the Jews at times. Okay, when it was preached from the pulpit, okay, and it was the church using its authority, both spiritual, religious, and political, to actually physically torture and persecute and even execute the Jewish people. How did the church get it wrong? Well, here's what, here's what it appears that happened as they read the book of Romans, and may we not have to fall into this error, okay? What happens is that the church got to the end of chapter eight, and then blinked, okay? And I call this blink theology. You know, you've heard of replacement theology. This is blink theology. Now, don't worry if you've never heard about it because I made it up. <laughs> blink theology, okay? We got to the end of chapter eight and we're going, yay, yay, God, all right? And then we blink and we close our eyes only for a moment, it seems. But when we open them again, lo and behold, it's Romans chapter 12, verse one. <laughs> I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the, by the, uh, in the renewing of your mind. Okay, you know, we go, oh yeah, okay. And we go on. And basically, if you, if you blink and you skip Romans chapters nine, 10, and 11 and jump back in at the beginning of Romans chapter 12, you also get the impression that the last chapters of Romans are kind of, you know, like they're, they're practical issues, you know, what we would call maybe housekeeping issues, and then there's salutations, and basically, he, in these final chapters, he's just trying to end the letter, all right? But the, the question is, why, why do we blink? Okay, because after all of this incredible teaching and theology, okay, right up to the end of Romans chapter eight, suddenly, in Romans chapter nine, 
the apostle starts writing to us about Israel, the nation of the Jewish people. All right, and for centuries, great Christian scholars and teachers and leaders of the church, they got to that point in the letter, and they went, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute. Why is the anointed apostle, the inspired apostle Paul, now writing to us about Israel, the nation of the Jewish people? Okay, because there's no Israel, the nation of the people. I mean, the nation, nation of the Jewish people. They're, they were destroyed by the Romans, you know, you know, a few decades after Jesus was crucified. They're, they, they, they're, they're not a nation anymore. They're scattered, okay? And, and uh, there's no hope that they'll ever be a nation again. They're gone. So, so what, 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 what could this mean? It's right in the heart of the letter. Well, maybe what it means is it's just history. Okay, that was, the tr that was how it was in Paul's day. It's over now. It was just history, so basically we can ignore it. Or maybe it, it's, 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 we should spiritualize it. So whenever it talks about Israel, it really means us. All right, we're the spiritual Israel now. We're the new Israel now. We're the redeemed Israel now. So wherever it says Israel, we'll just replace it with us. Okay, this is why I say is, this is one of the roots of replacement theology. And if that wasn't confusing enough, by the time they got to Romans chapter 11, now in Romans chapter 11, the apostle writes to them directly about Jews and Gentiles in the New Testament church and the proper relationship between Jews and Gentiles in the New Testament congregation. And these great churchmen, these great scholars, these great Christian leaders of past centuries, they looked at their congregations all over the Western world and they said, this, how, how can this be inspired scripture meant for us? Okay, because there's no Jews here. Oh, uh, one or two, but they don't identify as Jews. Why, they've become good Christians like us. All right, so they thought, well, what do we do with this? Well, maybe it's just history and we can ignore it. Or maybe it just simply means that we're all the new Israel. Okay, and we as the church, we've just replaced them. But in both cases, both in chapter 9, 10, and 11, it was unclear enough so that it was just more convenient to blink, <laughs> right? We just blinked, and, we, and the church blinked for about a thousand years. Now, I remember once being in Singapore, and I was, uh, I was giving a message that was similar, similar to this, and uh, afterwards, uh, a, a woman came up to me and she showed me her Bible. So this will tell you how many years ago it was, because. They were carrying paper Bibles. And, but this one wasn't just a paper Bible, okay? This, this, <laughs> this was an Oxford Bible. <laughs> okay, you, you remember, well, maybe you probably still have them here, you know? Oxford Bibles, this was leather, leather, leather covered, okay, with gilt edges, okay? I mean, this was a real Bible, Bible, okay? And she had it opened to Romans chapter 11. All right, and in the Bible, the editors had, had, had helpfully put liner notes, okay? There were notes and references. You know how those Bibles, how great they were, okay? So, so she showed me the liner notes that the editors of that beautiful Bible had written about Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. And you know what they said? They said, these chapters are parenthetical chapters. Parenthetical chapters, okay? Like, like I thought, she said, that's kind of odd, isn't it? I said, yes, that's very odd. <laughs> like, what does that mean? That they don't belong in the letter? That Paul didn't write them, maybe? Or they were inserted later by editors? I mean, what do you mean by parenthetical? So it got me started on a quest, and I've come to the conclusion, I'm gonna share that with you today. They're not parenthetical chapters, they're the pivotal chapters of Romans. If you want to know why Paul sat down to write the letter to Rome like he did, it's because of those three chapters. That is the heart of the letter. All right, now why do I think that? Now we, we have many letters uh, written by Paul, a number of letters written by Paul that are inspired and part of the New Testament scriptures. Most of those letters that he wrote to congregations that he planted like, like, uh, like in Thessalonica, like in Corinth, uh, in, in, uh, in Galatia, okay, he wrote 
to fix problems. Okay, so he had gone out apostolically, he had preached the gospel, he had made disciples, he'd, he'd, he'd raised up leaders, planted congregations, and moved on. Then, then he, he comes back home and uh, he wants to know, well, so how are things going? Okay, it's been a year, it's been two years, it's been several years since I was there with you in Thessalonica. What's happening? And he's getting these reports. Well, everything's, everything's good, except, <laughs> except we, we've got these problems, all right? So not being able to get on a plane and fly to Turkey, okay? Or, or, you know, to, he, he, he's, gonna, he's gonna write a letter. So most of the letters that Paul writes, somehow he's addressing problems, okay? Like the, the believers in Thessalonica, they had wrong ideas about the return of the Lord. So he, he needs to set them straight. The believers in Galatia are being taught that they have to come back under the Mosaic law. They have, basically, they have to become Jews in order to convert to Judaism in order to believe in Jesus, okay? He writes to correct that. In, in, uh, in Galatians. The Corinthian church, oh my God, the Corinthian church had so many problems, he had to write two letters to them, okay? I mean, they had, you know, you know morality issues, you know, family issues, and, and serious, serious congregational problems. So he's writing to correct problems. What's the problem in Rome? They, they have a controversy, a big controversy, and it's about leadership. Who gets to lead the Roman church? Is it the Jews or the Gentiles? And probably it happened like this. That, that Roman church was planted by Jewish believers. Of course, he, of course they were. They were the, they were the ones who, who went out there. And, and, and they, they started that church. They led it, they, they led it through the persecutions, okay? And then under uh, one of the, I think it was Nero, they, they were all expelled from Rome. All right, we know the Jews were all expelled from Rome. That's why Paul met Priscilla and Aquila in Corinth. Okay? They were, he, it says in the Corinthian letter, they were, they were from, uh, no, I'm sorry, in, in Acts. It says in Acts that they were from Rome, but they had been expelled by the Roman emperor. Okay? So all the Jews were expelled, and the Gentile church was left on its own. But it, but it had been started well, and, it con and the Lord's anointing was on it. It started to grow. But now it's all Gentiles led by Gentiles. A few years later, under Emperor Claudius, the Jews are allowed to come back, okay? And they come back and they say, okay, so we're back. And the Gentile leader says, well, it's great. Just sit and listen, you know? We don't need you in leadership anymore, okay? And the, and the, and the Jews, the Jewish leaders probably said, what are you talking about? We planted this church. We, we gave you the scriptures. We led you through the persecutions. Our, Jesus is, one, is from us, you know? Without us, you, you wouldn't even know, you wouldn't know what you even know now. Okay, what do, what do you mean you, do, you don't want us back in leadership? Okay, and the Gentile leaders probably said, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah we, we honor you and, and everything, but look, everybody in the church is Gentile now. All the new growth is Gentile. We're, 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 we're penetrating the Roman society now, okay? And, and, uh, and we're doing okay, we don't need you. They had a controversy. Paul heard about it, and he wrote to correct that issue. He wrote the letter so he could write Romans chapter 11 to them. That's, it's not parenthetical, it's pivotal. All right, that was his MO, that was his, his, the, his modus operandi. That, that's what he did, he wrote to correct errors, to fix problems. He's apostolic 24 seven. All right, then you might ask, so why, among all of his letters, did he write all of that beautiful, sequential, comprehensive theology in the first chapters? That's unique. Okay, well, there's a reason for that. That's his resume. Because of all the New Testament epistles written by the Apostle Paul, Romans is the only one that he's writing to believers that he didn't lead to the Lord. He didn't lead them to the Lord, they're not his spiritual sons, and he didn't plant the congregation in Rome. He's never been to Rome. He tells them that, I've never, I've, he's never been to Rome when he wrote that letter. All the other letters, they're either written to his spiritual sons or they're written to congregations that he personally planted, where he, he's known, he's the apostle, he's their spiritual father. He's writing with authority. The Romans not, so what does he do? 
He starts at chapter one and he says, this is my gospel. This is the message that has been entrusted to me apostolically by the risen Lord. Okay, and like us, they start at the beginning of the letter, they go down the Roman road, okay? They, they, they say, this is, yeah, this is sound teaching. They, then they get to Romans 7, like us, they identify with him. Yeah, that's right, he's, he's, he, he knows what's going on with us. We struggle, he struggles, okay, this is good. Like us, they get to Romans chapter eight, of course, they didn't have the chapters back then. By then they get to what we call chapter eight and they're going, wow, this is, this is anointed. <laughs> this, is, this is anointed, this man has a message from the Holy Spirit, okay? Truly, he's the apostle that we heard that he is. Okay, truly, okay, we can listen to this man. This man is, going to, is writing to us inspired by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so he gets to the end of Romans chapter 8, and then he says, okay now, brothers, I have something I need to say to you, and it's about the Jewish people. You need to understand this about the people of Israel, and you need to understand, and here's how it works together, Jews and Gentiles in the New Testament congregation. All right, now, Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago, right? And since he wrote it until today, basically, the Jews have wandered and the church has blinked. Now they're back. Now they believe, or they're beginning to believe. Now in congregations like mine, it's Jews and Gentiles. In marriages like mine, it's Jew and Gentile, all right? It's, this, is, this is reality now in the nation of Israel. We don't blink. We get to the end of chapter eight and we just go right on. The roadblock has been, has been removed. Where it says Israel, the people, the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jewish people, we don't blink. We say, okay, well that's Israel. We know what, what Paul's talking about now. When he talks about Jews and Gentiles in the New Testament congregation, well, that's what we're doing every day in the land of Israel. Jews and Arabs, specifically, okay? Building a one new man community, okay? And now it's spreading beyond the borders of Israel and Messianic Jews are reaching out to Arab Christians throughout the region. I, I, there's, there's a handful of ministries birthed in Jerusalem that are all based on the final verses of Isaiah chapter 19. Okay, they call themselves uh, Highway 19, okay, I-19, okay, about this prophetic vision, okay, of Egypt and Assyria, basically the, 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 the sons, sons of Ishmael and the, today's uh, modern Arab world and Israel as the third partner in that, worshiping together, okay, and, and being, being a, a blessing and a, and a praise in the midst, midst of the earth. This is reality for us, so we don't have to blink. And you're that generation with us as you come into this revelation. Then we realize if you don't blink and you, and you go through 9, 10, and 11, and there's just so much there, so much that, that he's teaching that applies to us today, you realize the final chapters, 12 through 16, it's not just details, practical details, housekeeping and salutations. He's not trying to end the letter. That's when after solving their problem, addressing their problem, he rises to his full stature, okay, of the premier apostle to the nations, and he gives apostolic instructions, not just to Rome, but to the whole church. How to deal with government, how to deal with the weaker, weaker brothers in your midst. I mean, apostolic instructions, and, and you realize this is one of the more, most magnificent works of a spirit-led ministry uh, in 2,000 years. Um, we, it still takes my breath away just simply to read what he wrote in Romans chapter 11 because it's with laser-like accuracy that he describes the issues that we deal with today. Uh, and uh, all the more astounding when you realize he wrote it 2,000 years ago. To us, okay, it's as if he wrote that letter to us yesterday. <laughs> This is how it works, <laughs> brethren. And this is why Jews are back and why you want to protect Jewish identity while bringing about yet a new identity in the one new man, all right? So, you know, like, like what he taught to the Galatians, you know, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither male nor female, but you're all one in Christ, okay? That doesn't mean you lose the distinctives, right? 
It's not, it's not, we don't homogenize, okay, which is what the modern world and, and uh, pagan, neo-pagan culture is trying to do. We don't homogenize men and women so that there's no, no difference. And we don't homogenize Jews and Gentiles. There's, there's a difference, okay? If you're born of the tribes of Israel and your people have been called back to the land, you have this, you have this, this privilege, you have this obligation to, uh, to, to be a part of that. And yet, before God, we need to understand that the value of God, of every single person in his kingdom, is held equal before him. And we walk in equality, even though we walk in diversity of function. Uh, and we need to respect uh, identity while uh, exalting the king of kings and holding up this incredible union that we have in the, in the body of Christ, which is meant to be a light to the world. And I'll tell you, just in, the, in microcosm, uh, it, when Jews and Arabs in Israel stand up together and demonstrate love for one another because of shared faith and devotion to the Messiah, Jesus, it really has an impact. Probably more impact than other things that we do. Because, because the politicians have just about given up figuring out how this is going to work. <laughs> you know, and, and the religious leaders are at each other's throats. All right? they're, they're adding fuel to the fire more than, more than, than trying to find a, a solution to it. It's really only in the body of Christ that you see Jews, Arabs from different, from different nations standing up together and proclaiming the, the glories of the coming kingdom of God. Okay? The Prince of Peace, the Star Shalom. Okay, so in the next few minutes, I know that you, you've gone into Romans chapter 11. I'll just uh, want to make some highlights from the, from the messianic uh, point of view. Let's just take a look at um, Romans chapter 11, uh, verse 1. Uh, here's what, um, what Paul writes. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's pretty astounding. When I say blink theology, I mean the church really blinked. It wasn't like we had our eyes half open, okay? We closed our eyes, okay? Because here's what Paul writes in Romans chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, has God rejected, cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin, verse 2. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. I mean, that's pretty clear, right? So you have to ask yourself the question, how could Christianity, Western Christianity, for more than a thousand years have taught exactly the opposite? How could we have made it church doctrine that God had rejected the Jews because they had rejected his son? And by the way, when Paul wrote these words, was he aware that his people, the Jewish people, had rejected Jesus? Of course he was. In fact, no one of his time was more aware of that. Remember, before he was born again and filled with the Holy Spirit, he was a persecutor of the early believers. He was the guy holding the coats of the people that stoned Stephen to death and heartily agreeing with them. He was the guy dragging off the early believers to imprisonment and, and punishment. He was on his way to Damascus to do even more when God got a hold of him. He, he hated the early believers, okay? So, and then when he became a believer, his former friends in religious Judaism, they tried to kill him, not once, but several times. The story he's let down in a basket over the, the, the walls of Damascus because they wanted to assassinate him. He's taken by, by, by armed guard from, from, from Jerusalem to Caesarea with the, lead, the Roman legion you know, watching over him because he's under an assa assassination threat. Groups of Jewish zealots had sworn that they wouldn't, they wouldn't break their fast until they had killed him. All this is in the biblical record. No one knows better than Paul that his people, the Jewish people, have rejected Jesus. But still he writes, still he writes, has God rejected them? Don't even think about it, he says. Don't even go down that road. Don't take a step down that road. Don't let that thought even enter your mind. So you gotta, understand, you gotta ask the question, how could the church have gotten it so wrong, all right? 
we blinked. We blinked. We didn't open our eyes until Romans chapter 12, verse 1. So then he goes on to explain what happened. Um, you, he's answering our questions. So what, so what did happen to the Jews? Well, did they stumble so that they should be destroyed? Look in Romans chapter 11. Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. And I know Pastor Phil has spoken to you directly about that. That God used the failure of the Jewish people to see in Jesus their Messiah and their stubborn refusal to accept him as, as, their, as their Lord and King. He used, he used that failure as an opportunity to bring the gospel directly to us. We didn't have to wait for a Jewish apostle to arrive. Other Gentiles preached to us. Other Gentiles led us to the Lord and the Christian movement has gone led by Gentiles for almost 2,000 years. God said, okay, this isn't, this, you know, Jewish refusal, Jewish failure isn't going to stop God's plan to bless the nations. He's just going to set them aside for a while. But when we realize that, that we were the beneficiaries of, of their failure, then, then Paul reminds us that we have that obligation. He says, okay, remember that part of, your, part of the reason that, that you're brought in by the grace of God without the requirements of becoming like them, okay, knowing the law and, and trying to obey the law for a thousand years that the Jews had, the Jews had had the, the Torah for a thousand years by the time of Paul. You don't, you don't have to go through that. You come right in by faith, just like the laborers, who come into the vineyard late in the day, <laughs> you're gonna get paid the same amount, okay? You get the same reward without having to do all of the work, okay? And so he's saying, okay, so, so you got a free ticket uh, to, to come in late, okay? But, but, but just remember this, that part of your call is to provoke them to jealousy because they're still outside. Just, it, it, it's, it's so perfect because that's exactly what we face in Israel today. Okay, then he says, uh, uh, if they're being cast away is the reconciling of the world. This is verse uh, 15. If they're being, they're the Jews, if they're being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? You know, this, this is amazing to me because Paul is ministering the word of God. And 2,000 years ago, he saw the restoration of Israel. <laughs> you know, he saw it. He said, you know, they're, they're going to come back. And, and God will use the day of their rejection as a glorious day. And we read about it in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the story of what the Holy Spirit did in the day of the Jewish rejection of Jesus. And we think the book of Acts is glorious, right? Paul says, if you think that was glorious, you wait till they come back. Isn't that what he's saying? Okay. If, they're, if they're being cast away, was God's opportunity to reconcile the world? What will their acceptance be but life from the dead? I mean, that's amazing, amazing prophecy. Not only because it was 2,000 years ago. I mean, listen, if we prophesy what's going to happen two days from now, we're doing really well. We can go on Facebook and boast about it, and we're going to be... You know, among the prophets, okay? This man, 2,000 years later, you know, he hits the, right in the center, you know, bang! You know, it's incredible. He says, they're coming back, and that day is going to be greater than the days of the book of Acts. All right? So he's prophesying the, the emergence of the Messianic Jews before, the, before that was, before, long before anything that we know about. Okay, so then he explains about the two olive trees and the we Gentiles are the wild olive branches that are grafted into the Abrahamic tree by faith and that we shouldn't be haughty or arrogant against the broken off Jewish branches, okay, because, I mean, really, we really blinked, right? Because he's specifically saying, all right, even in their unbelief, we should never have arrogance towards them. Again, over and over again, you have to ask the question, how could the great leaders of the Christian movement that changed the Western world, that defined the Western world, how could they have got it so wrong 
when it came to the Jewish people, when the premier apostle of the New Testament in the heart of the New Testament is writing so clearly. He's saying, you Gentile believers, you're the grafted in branches. The Jewish branches have been broken off because of unbelief. Don't boast against them. Okay, but if you do boast, remember, it's not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. Clear, isn't it? Clear. We really, we really blinked. And then Paul reveals, because God is able to take the broken off, dead Jewish branches and graft them in again. If you were grafted in as a wild olive tree into the, against nature, okay, into the tree of covenant with God, the Abrahamic tree, and now by faith you belong, okay? Not as some second-class branch, but you're part of it. You're receiving the same nutrients from the root, your same growth, the same fruitfulness is, is destined for you. Don't you think that God can take the broken off natural branches and graft them back in again? That's what he says. He's predicting that the day will come. And the amazing thing for us is that we're on the other end of this letter. You know, it's like, it's like, I don't know, you don't do this and this. I'm going to use an American football illustration. Isn't that crazy? No, I won't. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, I don't know what else to say. It's like the, the ball was thrown from one end of the field, okay, 2,000 years ago, right? And it's been floating in the air, okay? And just by the grace of God, we happen to be the generation that gets to catch this ball, all right? I mean, think about it. We're the generation that has seen them come back. We're the generation that has seen them believe again. All right? We're the generation to go that is able to read these verses from Paul and go, Paul, you were right. You were right, okay? Bang, we got it, okay? They're back, okay? Incredible. Incredible. If they, if they don't continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. God's able to graft them in again. This is verse 24. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these Messianic Jews, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Okay, here's where it gets specific to us in Israel today. We have enemies of the gospel in Israel. The ultra-Orthodox Jews, you know, we, ha we share values with them. They are pro-life. They, uh, they don't want the termination of human life through abortion. They stand, uh, they stand strong on, on family values. Uh, they, they stand strong on other um, uh, moral and ethical issues, and we are, have common cause with them. But they vehemently disagree with us when it comes to Jesus as the Messiah. So vehement is their, is their opposition to us that if they had the power and which they are gaining, they would put us in jail for sharing the gospel. Or they would try to delegitimize us and push us out of the country. They, 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 don't, want to, they don't want to marginalize us, marginalize us. Some of their leaders want to criminalize us. Okay, so we have enemies in, in our country who, uh, after this most recent election, are powerful, more powerful than they than they have been in the past. Here's what Paul writes, verse 28. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's, he's writing to us. He's saying, yeah, okay. They're, they're enemies, and you, you, you have to deal with that, them as a threat to, to your, your life as believers and your activities as sharing the gospel with, uh, with the people, people of Israel. But don't forget, they are still beloved for the sake of their fathers, and the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The gift and the calling of God has to do with God's promise to Abraham. He said, you and in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. He said previous to that, I will make you a great nation. Okay, I will make you a great nation. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's the call of Israel. And the gifting that went along with it, the, the, the Jewish brilliance, the Jewish ability to survive under 
inhuman uh, persecutions, the gifts that went along with it, God says, I'm never taking them back and I'm never changing my mind. All right, now you can take this verse out of context and apply it to yourself. That's okay, and I've done it numerous times, especially when I've done terrible mistakes in ministry and I'm sure that the Lord is finished with me and I'm ready to quit, but then I come back to this verse and I say, well, I can't quit and the Lord's not finished with me because the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. <laughs> right? you, and you're welcome to take that verse, as I have done many times, out of context, apply it to yourself, you can borrow it anytime you want. But when you're done borrowing it, please put it back where you found it. <laughs> okay, because you can obviously see this is clearly about Israel. God says, even in their unbelief, even when they oppose the gospel, I'm not changing my mind about them. And by extension, and he's not changing his mind about us either. That's the God we serve. Okay, this is, there's so much to be said. This is an incredible letter, okay? But I hope that today you get, you get some insights into this and realize that 2,000 years has passed since the New Testament was written and handed over to us, okay? They were at the beginning of this great Christian endeavor that has gone to the ends of the earth, okay? And now we're towards the end, all right? Now God is finishing things up, and we need to be thinking about final things, final things like what is the bride? How do we get the Jews and the Gentiles together? How do we produce the bride? What does it mean to truly be a disciple? How are we gonna deal with, uh, with, with culture that gets darker every day? and more malignant every day, okay? More poisonous to, to faith every day. How can we produce the kind of believers who will stand, not just stand, but who will shine in the days ahead, okay? Because that's God's intention, okay? Final things, okay? And uh, we realize that's where we stand uh, in, in these, these end times. And I believe this is why these words have stood for 2,000 years and will continue to stand because they're inspired by the Holy Spirit and given to us as a gift of God. This is the words of God given to us by the Spirit of God. So let's pray and, uh, and let's, let's ask God, put that within me, Lord. Put that same spirit uh, within me. To, oh, be, before you pray, please give me a little bit of grace. What happened at the end of this, at the end of chapter eight, I think Paul had a, moment where God whispered in his ear. Remember, he didn't have a word processor, so he wasn't going back and re-editing this. He didn't have chat GPT that was writing it for him, okay? It was like he, he was, he's dictating this or writing it himself as fast as he gets it. It's one time, okay? <laughs> All right? It's flowing through him, but I think as this was flowing to him, through him at this point, God may have whispered in his ear, Paul, Paul, it's gonna take 2,000 years. <laughs> But 2,000 years from now, they're gonna be reading this letter and they're gonna be going, Paul, you were right. <laughs> Thank God for you, okay? I, I think he got a moment of that. You know why? Because he ends chapter 11 singing. He sings, okay? <laughs> I'll just, you can read the rest of it. Here's what he sings. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, I mean, really, he's not done with the letter. He still has five more chapters to write, okay? He's singing. Because I think right at that moment he went, whoa, this is good stuff. <laughs> All right. So may you, you hide this in your heart and, and take courage, okay? Take courage because these words were written for us in our day. So Lord, we just want to thank you. We thank you for the Apostle Paul. Thank you for, for the, the gifting and, and the anointing in this man and his calling. But thank you, Lord that you have similarly called us today to be the recipients of this word, to be the ones 2,000 years later that this word strikes home to us 
so that we can finish the work, we can complete the race, and we can bring the gospel back through Central Asia, back through the Arabic-speaking world, back through the remaining unbelieving nations, and the fullness of the Gentiles will come in, and then we will see all Israel saved, because this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout all the world, to every nation as a witness, and then the end will come. So encourage us with these words, Lord, and hide these truths in our hearts. Make us fruitful in these end times. We pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. 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 God bless you.